All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Crypto 101 podcast. I'm your co-host, Bryce. Today, not joined by my uh, my notorious compadre, Pizza Mind, who's traversing Taiwan. Uh, crazy, crazy area uh, of the of the world right now, just geopolitically. It's like uh, literally a tug of war uh, between <laughs> Taiwan and uh, China. So yeah, Pete, have fun over there. There's a lot of crazy uh, crypto conferences going on right now. He's having a ton of fun, but uh, I'm joined today by an awesome guest, Brian Gallagher, who's the co-founder of Partesia Blockchain, doing a lot of work in the zero knowledge proof and the multi-party uh, computation world MPC. So we're going to dive into all of that. But first, uh, Brian, welcome to the Crypto 101 podcast. How are you doing? Doing excellent. Thank you. Um, sounds very interesting that your uh, co-host would be in Taiwan at this time. I imagine it's like right. a very interesting energy and a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of action. So hopefully he gets some cool vlogs and stuff to share with the community. I'd be interested to see that, especially if there's some crypto things going on. Yeah, 100%. We, we've, uh, we've asked him to do some video recording for our YouTube channel. So if you guys are uh, on YouTube or whatever, watching at home, uh, make sure you check out Crypto 101 podcast on YouTube. Aaron's going to be reporting from, uh, from Taiwan. So we'll see how that goes. But Brian, we got you here on the Crypto 101 podcast. We're talking crypto all day, yeah. every day, and you're coding crypto all day. You're building Cartesia blockchain. So tell us from a high level, uh, you know, what are you doing in the crypto space and, you know, how'd you get here? How long have you been here? Are you a veteran or are you a guy who's like, you know, just, uh, you know, kind of branching into the crypto world right now? Mm, yeah, no. So I've been around basically since the beginning. Um, as an observer, at least in the beginning, and then I, as a Bitcoin buyer around 2015, as a DAP builder in 2016, 17, and now the Partesia blockchain is our capstone project. It's a layer one protocol. We call it also a layer one plus two because we provide uh, privacy as a service to other blockchains. So you can think of us as like a second private, second layer for privacy on other chains like ETH, Polygon doing Binance Smart Chain integration next. We're even going to bring Bitcoin over. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but basically, Partesia blockchain, layer one plus two solution. The reason we invented it is because um, in 2017, when Ethereum starts to take off, there were obvious scalability issues. Uh, there's also no privacy built in. So we took two or three years to architect um, and design this solution. Artesia, the company, has been around in advanced cryptography since the 80s uh, from a research standpoint and then from wow. a commercial development standpoint since 2008. Uh, if you look up the first commercial use case of MPC in a research paper called MPC Goes Live, the uh, Partesia actually uh, launched the first commercial use case of MPC where they ran a sealed bid auction uh, for the Danish government. Partesia is a Danish uh, wow. organization. And then we decided, uh, you know, after 12 years of uh, commercial enterprise, MPC, multi-party computation, to make a layer one blockchain that incorporates MPC into the protocol itself. And the reason you need to wow. do that is because when you run MPC environments, uh, typically you can think of Firebox as the most popular solution now. You'd have maybe a secret key sharing scheme of a couple parties. Um, but it's not very decentralized, uh, although it does keep secrets, um, you know, amongst each party and it is very secure. Uh, what we're creating is the most secure implementation of MPC ever, where you have hundreds of node operators, secret sharing keys, instead of just a small few entities that are running a private implementation. And what this allows you to do is have the most advanced interoperability that the market's seen yet. Because a lot of the hacks you've seen uh, have come from smart contracts that maybe had, you know, a small DCIG or just a couple, a single key owner. Right. And someone manages to get like in the there. the Ronin bridge hack. Yeah, they managed to get in there, get the keys to the Oracle of the bridge and just take all the assets out. So as part of our design, we took into account three core components, scalability, interoperability, and privacy. With scalability, we built sharding into the protocol so that we can shard transactions uh, and uh, do higher throughput. You know, we can scale bigger. Um, 
For interoperability, we use the MPC uh, plus a what we call um, epoch uh, system. So another thing with the Ronin bridge hack and others, for example, is all the risk accumulates into one place. You have all these bridges that have all this risk and assets getting bigger and bigger and bigger until someone hacks and steals everything. The way Partizia blockchain interoperability works is as an asset like ETH is sent across, you know, the bridge on the Partizia blockchain, every 50 or 100 ETH, a new epoch is formed. So even if a hacker managed to penetrate uh, over two thirds of the nodes who are running a secret uh, key sharing scheme, they then got in, they would then have to deconstruct each epoch to get the actual funds out. So there's not just one big pool of risk accumulation. Uh, so that's another reason why our design is the most secure. And then finally, our bread and butter is in privacy. So MPC, you know, by default is all about private, you know, being able to compute on encrypted numbers, being able to compute on secret data. And what that means is you could have uh, a, a common example people use is we could have 100 of us in a room and the MPC could read each of our bank account balances and it could determine who the top uh, bank account balance is without knowing the actual balances in each account. So it's a way to preserve the secrecy of data, but get results out of it. And so that unlocks- so it'd be like that thing that was at Art Basel, the uh, the little ATM. I don't know if you saw that where everybody would swipe their card and see who has the highest. It could tell you kind of like who's the highest without showing you the actual balance publicly. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't hear about this uh, <laughs> demo. It sounds pretty cool, but it's a, it's a similar concept. Yes, I don't know if they were using MPC, um, but they the what. Because you asked that question, it uh, brings up an important point. Uh, in the industry, zero-knowledge proof is a very uh, common word that's being thrown around now, right? And it's all about how do you exchange yes. a secret. Very catchy, and very buzzy. Yeah, very buzzy, very catchy. But really what it is is it's a limited computation to two parties. So, for example, in, in these privacy coins, if me or you were to, if I was to send you Monero, for example... Uh, we could share that secret that would prove that I sent you the funds, but the public couldn't see it, right? But if we wanted 100 parties to be able to conduct a transaction, it wouldn't work. You need multi-party computation. That's why it's named secure multi-party computation. So we sort of think of the zero knowledge we bring to the industry as like the web three of zero knowledge. Because you have these first two-party okay. implementations, which have seen adoption like privacy coins or you know secret swaps. Uh, between two, two parties. Uh, but now you can do much more advanced use cases like sealed bid auctions from thousands of people. Um, you, know, you could do massive healthcare data exchanges where you could have all the criteria of patients without knowing the data of each patient. You could start to do surveys. So you could target AIDS positive, HIV positive patients without knowing who they are or necessarily knowing anything else about them. It just is able to find matches on encrypted secret data. So we sort of view this as a very, it's definitely a technology that's a bit ahead of its time. So let's say, you know, by 2030, it could really take off. But the thing is, as you're seeing a chat GPT and these other artificial intelligence algorithms that are coming, mm -hmm. you could start to tell these AIs things to do with big data sets, and then they would be able to do it in a much more computationally efficient way, leveraging MPC to preserve everyone's privacy. So like in this utopian view, you know, there's a dystopian view of blockchain, which is like we go towards, um, you know, the, the communist like CCP model of like complete social uh, credit score tracking, CBDCs <laughs> that can be confiscated right out of your account, you know, totally centrally controlled entity to a more utopian view, which is like everyone controls their own assets and data. You can validate and credential yourself and then be able to actually participate in different networks with those credentials without needing to expose who exactly you are, you know, what you are. And so you can imagine, again, a perfectly utopian view, government level credentialing, assigning to public keys which then use our new age devices that can have everything locally stored and encrypted about ourselves on our own device. And then smart contracts would allow a permissioning system uh, that you can participate in any transaction in, and then it would allow for the exchange of assets and data, assets being things like cryptocurrency in exchange for like, valuable data. So you can think of like ad network permissioning, where when you're using dApps, you're starting to get ads, uh, placed towards you because there are demographic credentials about you. 
Um, mm. But they like can't just push footprint. it on you. Yeah, you'd have to you have to permission everything, right? And so it ch- upends the data economy because right now there's central hosts that control all our demographics, like Facebook, Google, and then the ad targeting engines, uh, without our permission, show us the ads. And you know you could argue, well, the products that I get to use for free, and uh, I get really good ads that, like, I mean, I remember I was like, surfing Instagram or something not so long ago. And I did see like an ad for a really cool resort in like the desert of Utah when I was talking about Moab to a friend. So they probably listened to me, you know, and then showed me a glimpse. And it actually was valuable, even though they're like clearly listening to me talking and taking these weird analytics. <laughs> it was valuable. So like I'm not saying everything's evil about this. It's just that the data economy now works where it's pushed on you and it and it's all about Google and the monopolies that control the distribution of information and data. But it turns it upside down where you can leverage the blockchain, MPC, the technology we build, because it then allows the user to be the permissioner of certain things. Yeah. Right? So the opportunities are massive because people can come create new ad networks and displace the Googles in the long run unless they shift their business model completely. So so from like um, from a value standpoint, I think about the Lindy effect, right? Like Bitcoin is valuable and, and the Lindy effect kind of states that you know, the longer that a technology exists and survives in the wild, the more likely it is to exist and survive into the future. It's kind of just, you know, saying like, hey, this has got um, a good track record, right? And I look at something like Partesia and and this is actually something that I think I just learned that did I hear you guys were founded in the 80s and now Partesia blockchain is maybe just some um, kind of like a spinoff or some next evolution of Partesia. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm not a guy who's like an ageist guy, but you don't look really old enough to be a founder in the 80s. Right, Um, right. Maybe I'm being deceived. Yeah, no. So the, yeah, I'm 70 years old. I'm using advanced (laughs) aging reverse signal. No, so. I was like, you're not 70. No, so so the (laughs) R&D happened in the 80s between Ivan Domgard. He really got started. And like, if you look up the Merkel Domgard half function, like SHA-2. Yeah, Merkel Trees. Yeah, Ivan was one of the sort of uh, co-creators of the Merkel Domgard hash function. And Bitcoin is SHA-256. So a lot of the uh, cryptography innovations have come out of these early R and D projects dating back you know, into the eighties. And so from a commercial standpoint, Partesia then formed a actual company in 08, you know, uh, yes, for Bruce Nielsen, even Dom Gar, Kurt Nielsen, who's my co-founder of Partesia blockchain. Um, you know, he's a PhD economist from Berkeley. They've been, they started the private uh, company, uh, Partesia in Denmark doing commercial MPC. And then we co-founded uh, a Swiss foundation, Partesia Blockchain Foundation, based out of Zug, similar to the Ethereum setup, Tezos, Cardano, because this is a public protocol. So we're not selling uh, commercial enterprise software from the foundation. We're actually establishing a complete public protocol for anyone to leverage MPC. And that's one of the exciting things wow. is we've, we've seen the beginning of MPC. We see where it is now. It's starting to gain a lot of traction with companies like Fireblock selling commercial uh, setups. But again, the most valuable thing that we see for MPC is decentralized you know, uh, computation <clears throat> where you have hundreds of node operators. So that's what Partija Blockchain is all about. We have the MPC token. We named it after our flagship tech. And you have to use the MPC token to stake and run three different types of validators. One's a baker. Those are your basic blockchain transactions. Then there's zero knowledge nodes. That's where the uh, advanced computations run. So like, if you wanted to run a secret NFT auction with sealed bid pricing, you could run it through our node operators, where all the bids are put in secret across the different nodes. And it's uh, you know preserved there. Uh, the secret key sharing schemes protecting those computations. And then there's the BYOC nodes, bring your own coin, so we call it. And that is, uh, yeah, Americans always get the joke. You guys invent that? Yeah, I did. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, if you're like that's American, clever. Clever. if you're American or Canadian, you'd get the joke. But a lot of people don't don't know the <laughs> don't know the joke. So maybe I'll let them figure it out. But yeah, bring your own coin. Uh, you get to uh, bring ETH or USDC from Polygon, or we're doing Bitcoin, or we're going to do XRP. 
what we're doing is we're actually building the first like non-native interoperability swapping system. So you can imagine like you could just natively trade XRP through to Bitcoin and pass it through Partesia blockchain, which acts as a clearinghouse for these types of transactions. So it's like super decentralized finance in the high Atomic level. swaps is what they've also been called, right? Uh, yeah, that's again, that's like people just saying zero knowledge proof because it sounds fancy. Like it's a very misused term in a lot of uh, regards. So like I'm not going to say we're doing pure atomic swaps. It's a bit different, but okay. Um, it's advanced. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's advanced interoperability. And, uh, and um, you know, this is... Again, something that I think we bring unique to the market is, you know, you've got the privacy with this MPC and private smart contracts. We also are launching fully homomorphic, homomorphic encryption smart contracts, which wasn't part of our public roadmap. But it just, you know, we're, the beauty of Partesia is we've been building advanced cryptography since 08. So for us to, you know, sort of leverage existing repos of advanced cryptography like fully homomorphic encryption and adopt that to a rust smart contract model that's some that's a competitive advantage we have so we're, we're doing things like that so when you think about like the the technology that you're building and the empowerment that you're giving to the individual do you think that this is the inevitable way forward or are you fighting an uphill battle like i kind of think about it in the sense of like the crypto wars of 1999, where, you know, people said, oh, there's, you know, online encryption. And uh, you now you could use mm. your credit cards online because you could trust that they're not going to be f floating around in, this, yeah, in the, neat, in the ether to kind of get yeah. snagged. And that was like a really big uphill battle. Like the government tried to ban encryption online. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, there was, imagine there if they was were successful. many Supreme Court cases. Man, exactly imagine if they were successful. So I guess my question to you, you're building this. Is this inevitable for the individual? And it's, you know, because it's clearly the right way forward. Yeah. But what are your thoughts yeah. on this whole thing? Yeah, so two components to that. The beauty of open source public protocols is we put it out there and the developers have this sort of like Pandora's box they get to open and then anything can happen, right? With the way that the developers choose to adopt the technology um, and the way that, entrepreneurs decide to adopt the technology and try to create businesses around it. And that's why we're doing this. MPC is a very contained technology that only a few companies have created or had their hands on over the years. And by open sourcing these smart contracts and these capabilities and allowing a decentralized network of node operators to coordinate the private computations, it really sets the stage where, and that's again, back to the model of the Swiss foundation, that's the beauty of it is it's, it has a purpose. You know, it's not a private company. It's a Swiss foundation whose stated purpose is to de develop decentralized, you know, MPC privacy technologies that we release to the public. Mm -hmm. And so that's what makes blockchain so special. Cool. It's a lot more inevitable when it's under this model because it's open source and available on the internet. And there's nodes all over the planet running the system. You can then also use what we call jurisdiction management. We built flexibility into the smart contracts, allow different use cases or developers to segment off different areas of the network. So like you could restrict and adapt to a certain area of the network where only nodes, X, Y, Z, whatever can facilitate those transactions. And if you know those nodes are in, let's say the United States, you would have United States jurisdiction over those transactions. So we also have created a very flexible system for enterprise and more serious use cases to have a bit more control. There's one issue too is you have ETH or and is the and is the public network uh, is that the public network that uh, is permissioned like that or is that two segments? There's a private network where you can have those permissions and then there's an open that's public the network beauty. That is yeah, so that's the beauty of our chain is we we allow it's a big public network that has both public and private smart contract capabilities. There's a ton of flexibility okay. for devs, but it's all running like on the it. public network. Yep. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a ton of different ways we could take this conversation. One of the first things that comes to mind is and not to liken anything that you're building towards a mixer like tornado cash, yep. but um, in the same way, it's a smart contract. It's agnostic. It's just technology that's open source. It's living on a blockchain, bad mm -hmm. people, 
take that, they use it. How do you as a developer of a similar open source technology that doesn't mix coins, but allows privacy and it allows human empowerment, which I think at the end of the day is what the governments want to try and get rid of. They don't mm-hmm. want us to be empowered and, and have this uh, capability. You know, wh- wh- How do you think about building a technology that might land people in trouble with regulators or governments? Yeah, that's kind of like saying I could take a baseball bat and go play baseball and use it as like a robbery weapon. And so I think in <laughs> right. in the in the general scheme of the world, people can use tools for good and bad. Uh, that being said, of course, we did take all this into account. So I can give you a good example. What we didn't do is we didn't make protocol level pure privacy that's unavoidable which is like Monero, you know, there's no public mm-hmm. transactions on Monero. It's just purely private transactions. Or maybe I'm misquoting, but of the different privacy coins, there's some that are just pure privacy and you can't pick or yeah, choose Monero's whether or not. Example. Yeah. So um, what we've done is at the smart contract level, you have auditability. So an amazing use case that we're very proud of is that we've partnered with the International Red Cross, which for most people, you've heard of the Red Cross, one of the biggest totally. sort of charities in the world. And they wanted to build a private stable coin so that they could deliver aid to beneficiaries in crisis zones without putting it all on a public chain. Because one of the big problems they're trying to solve is sort of traceability of deployed funds. And when you give cash, very difficult to trace cash, right? But it's also the most convenient and the most helpful because it immediately is something that locals could spend, right? And if you gave them Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency, then it's all public. And unfortunately, bad actors could follow the trail of money in these dangerous locations where the beneficiaries are in in actual danger of theft, robbery. And it doesn't work. Yeah, physical danger. And so what we're doing with them is building a private stablecoin network where they are the controller of the smart contract. So they have full auditability of what's happening inside of the private smart contract that has their stablecoin. But the public can't see the transaction. So when they need to work with the regulator to comply with the different rules of you know, KYC, AML, traceability of funds, they have a full auditability and flexibility there. So it's a more advanced think- smart contract. Yeah, one one of the things that initially comes to mind just on that point is, isn't the auditability of you know where your donation is going, so that you as an individual could see, okay, I'm donating to the Red Cross. I'd like to see where this goes, in the same way that I'd like to see where my tax dollars go towards building what you know, point one percent of this road, and you know, point one percent of this water well. Um, d- does this kind of like actually allow the Red Cross to maybe um, you know? do whatever the hell they want with the money now that, you know, it's, it's untraceable or the, the, the donator doesn't get any auditability uh, into where his funds are going. Well, or, you or could, am I wrong? Or you could, you could argue the opposite, you know, when you just send it okay. to the bank and then it's gone. Right. <laughs> and like, yeah, if you look at, yeah, I'm not going to name different charities, but like uh, besides, you know, the Red Cross is an honorable organization, but there's other charities out there where if you look at their transparency reports, it's like, Oh, you know, we, it helps a lot of people. It's like, okay, well, I can believe you, but there's not enough. You know, we're heading towards a world, and they know this. So when you speak to the different NGOs, they're well aware, of it and, and they do want to take action so that they can have more transparency over where the money's spent. And blockchain's mm-hmm. perfect, and a private smart contract's perfect too, because they can publish data from the smart contract. They don't need to show which recipients got, you know, small beneficiaries were in danger, but they can say, Here's a transaction half from when we sent a local orphanage, you know, 10 grand to build a new uh, garage or something. So they're like the blockchain is such an improvement. And not only that, but a lot of NGOs struggle with actual delivery of funds. You know, the cash gets stolen. Uh, so we've heard from other NGOs, you know, they only get 20 cents in the dollar actually makes it where it needs to go, even though they tried to deliver it. It's not like they purposely lost the money. It's just, you know, it gets, gets, unfortunately, through the supply chain uh, lost. And so um, in this use case, yeah, you can use it to provide as much transparency as you want while also keeping secure the you know, beneficiaries. You couldn't really 
do that with the private banking system. It's like, what are you going to show bank wire confirmations like from your bank account? I guess you could do that, but they, they don't do that. So um, you could People easily don't publish, publish that kind of stuff. <laughs> no, you could easily publish the uh, transaction hash of something you're proud of without any issues. So. Are there any other um, kind of like, I know you guys said that you guys are doing a lot of cross chain sort of work, but is there any other blockchain ecosystem that you look at and you're inspired by, uh, you're, you're maybe looking like, Hey, those are the best mm. developers. These are mm. some really cutting edge tech, uh, sort of, you know, academic research over here. Any, anything that impresses you out there? It's a really good question. Uh, I gotta be careful the way I answer this. Uh, <laughs> Bitcoin impresses me. Ethereum is amazing. Um, Ethereum is certainly the one to aspire to. Okay. Some people make the argument they're going to become the AOL of blockchain, just a bit too slow and clunky. But, you know, they did the merge. You could argue it's good or bad in different ways. But they're the real deal because they've built a real ecosystem uh, that's insanely useful. You know, we're at the way beginning of, like, true DeFi, and the government, you know, is going to try to restrict it. But... You know, with the merge, that makes it a bit easier because now there's three companies that can kind of be forced to do things if they're told to. Because um, they're the ones who have everyone's tokens because people deposit the central. What are those three companies? Uh, don't quote me as fact, but I know Coinbase is up there, Lido, Binance, and there's a couple others. I think. Yeah, maybe Consensus, uh, the, the companies that control so much uh, Ethereum that are Bitcoin, staked. Bitcoin, Swiss. What are you saying? Yeah, Bitcoin, Swiss. Yeah, it's 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 the this exchange has benefited the most because everyone's got their money in Binance and Coinbase, so they just are able to run the nodes. And, you know, yeah. And I saw easy. something about fun. Coinbase. Yeah, I saw something about Coinbase uh, is now charging higher fees, so they're taking your deposits and staking them on your behalf and uh, giving yeah. you just a portion of the fees. It's kind of like a traditional bank, right? You deposit your cash. They yeah. lend it out and earn a little bit of interest. They take some risk with it. They pay you yeah. a fraction of it and keep the rest. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think their model's pretty fair. Uh, it's around 10% of the profit fee on your node. So it's not a it's not, it's not a racket. It's a pretty good deal. I mean, there's a lot of people out there who don't want to run their own node infrastructure. So for those, or maybe they're not capable or technical enough. And also, you know, you have to realize like, Securing your own keys and notes is not the easiest thing in the world. So sometimes right. a third party might do a better job with you. There is risk, but there's risk for both. Um, so I don't think there's any malicious fee modeling yet at this time. It's just unfortunate that technically it puts them in control of the keys with two or three other companies that would outweigh 50% of the network. Um, and it's a bit of dangerous to the ecosystem. So with Partesia blockchain, what we do is we only allow you to run one node per entity or individual. And we've created a whole decentralized KYC AML network so that as a node operator, you have to get a, um, a key, essentially, that proves you're not running other nodes. And there's third parties that handle that. So anyone can buy tokens, get a node running, read the network. But then to enter committee and earn the fees, you have to get proven that you're not colluding or a, a part of another organization. Uh, so we have about 100 nodes-ish running right now, and none of them are related to each other. So you could argue that you would need, you know, for us, two-thirds of committee needs to, to sign on to change something. So you could argue that you would need 67 different companies and individuals to collude on a, a decision. Whereas with ETH, you could argue it's three now, you know, which is really, it's terrifying for the network. Um but again, not to go too deep into the weeds here, but you could also argue, well, when it was proof of, proof of work, there were three big organizations that had all the half power. So, you know, who knows if it's, it might just be more transparent now of yeah. who it is. Back back in the day, we just didn't know who that was, but it existed. Um, but yeah, so I, we aspire to be like Ethereum uh, in terms of growing a real ecosystem, real adoption. Um, in terms of the other new projects, I think that, it's hard to impress us because our team is a very professional team of PhD cryptographers who've built and sold enterprise technology. And so outside of the hype cycles of crypto, there's reality. 
And when we look at some of the other <laughs> propo- proposals for interoperability and different things that raised, you know, 200 million or whatever, there's serious flaws in there. Um, and it's a bit unfortunate that the hype and the lack of technical expertise on these things is, could end up contributing to another hack of a bridge for a billion dollars. Um, yeah. And then, you know, what, what is impressive. So like those other projects, I haven't seen another, you know, 400 mil, you know, foundation raised of any of the big players. That's very good. And I'm again, not going to say names, but there's a lot of technical issues that is going to be very difficult. They're almost fatal, fatal flaws, but things that are incredible are is like, um, you know, like curve finance or something. It's like 200 lines of code and it could run billions and billions of dollars of lending and automated swapping and all this. And like, that's just developed by incredible, you know, CTO type guys who just write the code themselves and like gets the most insane, you know, next thing you know, there's billions of dollars that don't get hacked and function exactly as they're supposed to. So like that's from a use case perspective, that's like where I think you see some of the best delivery is people who come and just do one exact use case. It's really hard for the layer ones because uh, you get to solve so many different problems. Yeah, no, it, it's very well said. And, and I think, you know, even from from a kind of a different perspective of the user, um, you know, the users don't have a tremendous amount of applications yet in the Web3 space in terms of like day-to-day applications I could pull up on my iPhone or my Android and, and make my life useful. Um, they're getting there and you can see the the beginnings of it, um, but it's not on an everyday kind of standpoint yet. And I guess my question to you is, is from your vantage point, what's going to get us to the next 500 million users? You know, yep. say that that's kind of our best estimate right now is we got 500 million global users of somebody who's downloaded a wallet, or had a Bitcoin. How do we how do we actually bust open to that that next pl- uh, next stage of technological like adoption. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, like a bit of, um, a bit of like, let's build up to this exact moment. Right. So you had mining as the first use case in the beginning. Then you had trading. Mm -hmm. Then you had ICOs. Mm -hmm. Capital formation. Each of those had their, each of those had their boom and bust when people chased extracted value and then reality sets in and then the strength, the strong survive. Right. And so then you got to ICOs and those busted, but it was a really bad bear market last time. Um, after 2017, much, much more painful than this because true liquidity, Big hangover, truly a lot of up. projects built. Yeah. A lot of projects yeah. built, uh, huge treasuries of Ethereum. And just in order to keep the lights on, we're just market selling Ethereum. Yeah. And at the time, the tether market cap was like four billion, so I couldn't absorb, you know, three hundred billion dollar right. market cap. Uh, there was no USDC, there was no BUSD, there was no Paxos. So, like, unless you could get a fiat on ramp, off ramp through one of the OTC desks, which was very difficult, you were pretty much stuck in the position. And so, people lost their treasury; they couldn't afford to run the ops. And they had to survive for years and uh, it lasted way longer. But what happened is, and it caught me off guard, you know, because I was in the thick of it. All of a sudden, DeFi just started taking off and it was really, really like not scammy, but like uh, frothy, low liquidity, but exciting pumps and like yield farming that kind of just came overnight out of nowhere and people just started doing it. And then that got the in- ETH, the demand for ETH started coming back. And then, as in, in a perfect storm scenario, NFTs went nuts. So the demand for ETH just went on a huge bull run where everyone needed ETH to either uh, facilitate DeFi transactions or buy NFTs. So it was a prolonged buying demand spree for ETH. And that well has dried up a bit again. I mean, if you do a transaction now, it's like, you know, dollar to send. USDC, but at the peak of that, it was like $80 to send USDC. So right. where the demand is very low for ETH at the moment outside of speculation. And so it does need to hit a moment of what's the next use case that's going to drive this. And my thesis is more about 
you know, there's a small chance NFTs have a resurgence in a, in a different way that brings demand for ETH up. There's a small chance that DeFi gets a bit more pure and clean and safe where it's worth investing in and, you know, parking funds and liquidity pools that are more certain. But that's still probably a year or two years away, I guess. But what could happen is two big things. One is a use case we don't see yet that comes out of nowhere. Everyone starts using and gets excited about. Social networks could be the answer. And the way that could happen is you could have a reverse effect where Web 2 comes into Web 3. So if Snapchat decided to give you a blockchain wallet that has a private key tied to your Snap handle in a way where you can export that key and Snap can't see it, then uh, we're talking hundreds of millions of users could have a wallet right away, and then you can start having engagements in Web3. I don't know that it's going to happen. Wow. Clearly, Twitter's on the track Twitter. to do something. Yeah, so so Elon is probably going to bring 100 million, 200 million wallets. Uh, but we are actually launching a Web3 social network as well, and it's going to be pretty cool. You log in with like a Discord or Twitter handle. Those companies can't see your private key, but it opens a wallet right away. One of the big problems is user experience. When you make people like get a mnemonic phrase and like public private key to sign and log in, it's bad practice to be using a private key over and over on your devices. It's hard to educate yeah. the user, but if you make it a button click where they can sign in and it's basically backed up by a you know Discord login, now they're in the game. And then I think distribution comes through a different type of NFT. So like an area of focus we have is we want to bring artists in who would maybe want to sell their music or their future albums as secret NFTs. So like the album could be inside an NFT and then they're building sort of like the Teespring of, uh, of crypto where like Teespring was a platform on Facebook where you could, with a plugin, just start selling your t-shirts and then Teespring handled all mm -hmm. the fulfillment and everything. So if you make it that easy to, to create goods and distribute them, uh, and then there's already powerful audiences behind certain platforms and artists that gives them a venue to then say, Hey, you know, buy my live streaming access pass. I'm selling 50,000 of them for $10 each. Right. And they can clear half a million in revenue and start little social clubs. So like things like that, I think are going to bring a lot of engagement in. Um, and that's kind of what we'll see. It hasn't been done right, but it's something we've been working on for years and we have some patents on as well. Um, so that'll be interesting to see if we can get some traction there. But I, I would say that's probably where the adoption is going to come is through the social networks, both the Web 2, onboarding the users into Web 3, and then new solutions that kind of come out of nowhere and you know go super viral super fast. Yeah. No, I, I actually couldn't have asked for a better response to that question. Um, there was a perfect buildup, the crescendo, exactly who's going to be doing it. Probably Elon, right? Like, you know, he's stated, he's like, we're going to have payments on Twitter. Uh, he's 100% going crazy. to do it. Yeah. He's 100% yeah. going to do it. We, he, we, you want to talk about the uphill battle, though? Like, that's a guy with a price tag on his head. <laughs> like, oh boy. That's talk about disruption. I mean, if you put. Web3 yeah. payments and rails into an app like Twitter that has hundreds of millions of daily actives. You know, it's, a, it's a big threat to the system. So, you know, I was speaking uh, figuratively. <laughs> um, and I think more what I'm alluding to is just like, I think he's going to get a lot of lawsuits and challenges. You know, he even makes yeah. the joke, you know, the best way to get a lawsuit is run every day is running a public company. So, uh, you know, uh, he took it private, but they still know that he's got unlimited cash, so they're going to be suing him. They're going to be doing everything they can to disrupt the traction. So far, what oh, we've yeah. seen is they've tried to do that through emotional means, and he doesn't care. He's plowing yeah. ahead, full steam ahead. He's not back. He's built down. different. Yeah, so he's, you know, Elon someone for made president. A, I mean, he, you know, have you seen all these uh, Twitter files yeah. that he's been doing? He's just unveiling, pulling the curtain back behind. Mr. Oz, you know, or the Wizard of Oz, like he's showing how the sausage was made and it was not pretty. All the censorship that was going on at Twitter for the past couple of years. Uh, um, I think it's a good example. Of fucking he, Elon for president. Yeah. You know, he's born in South <laughs> Africa, so unfortunately he can't be the U.S. president. <laughs> Damn but, it. <laughs> but the, uh, <laughs> you, you know, two counter examples is like, he's good proof and you can, you should carry this into your startup. You know, when you have a vision and a roadmap, as fast as possible, full force, don't stop because the momentum gets harder and harder to 
I mean, what can people say? It keeps showing that the truth is getting exposed. They can't really tell them stop because it's like then you're exposing people by default if they're pushing back against you revealing truth after truth that's with evidence, right? And I think the yeah, counter exactly. example the counter example is like when Donald Trump was president, he would whine all day on Twitter about oh they're corrupt, they're doing this or that. He never would release documents like this. He he would never declassify internal comms and put it out there and expose people. Right. And he kind of just was trying to play by the the book and holding things back. And look where that got him nowhere, you know. So in this uphill battle, I think the key is you need to just keep exposing your truth because if people then yeah. counteract you, it's become more and more obvious that they are the problem, right? Everyone knows now right. that if like that if Reuters or the Guardian or any of these, you know, New York Times, let's, let's go with New York Times. And the New York Times is let's such a joke at this point. They're covering up <laughs> Sam Bankman Fried's fraud and like promoting yeah. him like a golden child who had bad luck. You know, it's like, okay, yeah. cat's out of the bag. No one can trust the New York They're Times. They're exposed now clearly. at this point. They're fully exposed. And, and the fact that they would let themselves be so obvious really makes you question. I mean, does Sam Baker Fried own the New York Times? Is it of the ten billion that's missing? You saw he, he owned it? the block, basically. So I mean, that, was wait, crazy. Exactly. that was crazy. Revolution. One domino at a time. One domino. He he, he yep. owns the block. <laughs> what? <laughs> he owned the block? So I, I mean that's like small scale, but are we gonna see that he also owned the New York Times? Why else would they put him on stage and let him speak? I mean I get that they get the views and subscriptions, so maybe they're just that desperate for revenue. But man, like totally exposed. So if at this point you still believe anything from the mainstream media, you're, you're, you, I can't help you. You know, I'm yeah. one of the opposites who that, was like an one, internet that, guy. <laughs> so with Bitcoin, for example, I mean, the first time I interacted with Bitcoin was in 2009. It was like three dollars a coin or something, and I was playing online poker, and we had me and my friends were really good, and we each would you know win a lot of tournaments. And so we had large player balances on the websites like poker stars. And I was always a not your keys, not your coins type person. So like I wouldn't leave my balance in there. I'd put it out into the bank and it was like hilarious. You you'd win a tournament on poker stars for a hundred thousand dollars and you'd cash it out to the bank and you'd get like a bank wire from Silverstein Jewelers in Canada. <laughs> you know, this is like two thousand nine and I was like nineteen, so no one cared. It was just like funny at that point, you know. Uh, but then one day I had won a tournament. It had been like three days and I hadn't cashed out just because I, you know, whatever. And then I went to do it and it's like payment processor down, just like FTX, right? <gasps> and uh, there was a guy, I'll even shout his handle out because like no one knows what happened to him. But I think his handle is like yellow sub or L86 or something. And he was like an OG of <laughs> online poker. I think he was like maybe almost 30 years old. This when I was like 19. So he had a lot more experience with like trading stock and other things outside of poker and like using capital. And in this forum called 2 Plus 2, he was shopping around 80 cents on the dollar deals where he's like, I'll buy your player balance for 80 cents on the dollar and I'll send you Bitcoin. Because you could transfer your account online to another player's account. So that still worked. You just couldn't cash out to the bank. So people were like actually sending their whole player balance and he was sending them Bitcoin in 2009. It was like three a coin. So we're talking like, wow. we're talking like 100,000 Bitcoin transactions, you know, uh, and stuff like that. So that's when me and my friends were like, what, what the hell is Bitcoin? So, you know, Bitcoin.org, there was a, a, like a one page website and a white paper. And so then, it, like the Ron Paul revolution was kind of getting popular uh, from like Occupy Wall Street and all that from the, the right. last crash. And so that was like, you know, what I would tell people is, you know, I would be mocked because I back then I was like a mainstream media fake person, and you were literally a lunatic if you were saying that stuff back in two thousand nine. But at the universities, people who kind of like read alternative news websites, they knew this stuff. Um, but it's funny because like something you can tell people is. Hey, maybe if you would have listened to that alternative news website, you also would have known about Bitcoin in 2009, right? Because <laughs> that's, that's where it was, they exactly. were talking about it, you know? So, like, literally. Um, so, yeah, no, it was just funny, funny, like, funny to see the progression because, you know, what, one thing to keep in mind about tech is, like, you know, we're building Partija blockchain, we're bringing these new use cases. 
But in 09, you know, we started thinking Bitcoin's the revolution and all that. And, you know, it's been 12 years, whatever. And it's, it takes a long time for this stuff to actually, you know, fully mature. And, you know, back in the, on the forums, because then there was like the Bitcoin forum uh, back then, and people would fantasize on there about trillion dollar market caps and stuff. Um, and so it takes, you know, 12 years and <laughs> it finally gets there. So like, yeah, we're going to see an advancement of use cases. And I think it's going to come through just these social networks, easy logins that have keys that you don't need to manage in such an awkward way. And then that's how we get there. Then, then it's full yeah. circle. Then it's full circle. It sounds like your, your, uh, I mean, your personal story kind of in closing, uh, is encapsulated by uh, a lot of patience. Um, and I think that's probably a word of wisdom uh, and a lot of skepticism, right? Like being skeptical of the mainstream media, being skeptical of other technologies that are out there and uh, not trusting, but but verifying. So my, my last question to you is, you know, if if you're a brand new person, you're getting into crypto, you heard about Bitcoin now, right? You know, 12 years after you first heard about Bitcoin. But, you know, what's your word of advice to a person who's just breaking in to the crypto industry? Maybe they're that 19 year old kid, right? Who's just learning about how to manage capital, right? Outside of uh, his own imaginary sort of uh, framework for school. Yeah. So I think the the ultimate starting point, and this is actually how I got more involved in the developer side of the industry, is I was attracted to communities. So Bitcoin was a community that I was attracted to because it had a revolutionary tone to end the Fed, you know, no more fiat. We want fixed money supply that's dictated by mathematics and not some stooge, you know, who can just with the stroke of a pen print trillions, which they still do. Right. Yeah. And so that was community. And the community was so strong that if you were a part of it, it you'd get like this tingly feeling every time you check in with the community. And so, like, there was something super powerful there. And that hasn't changed in the beginning of the ICO boom in Ethereum, there was community and it was super strong. So if you're dabbling into this industry for the first time, if you see an interesting use case or coin or NFT, you know, NFTs will start to have more utility. They're going to have to, it's not just going to be art. And I think NFTs will take a lot of the market share over utility tokens. I think utility NFTs are a bit more powerful because there's more community. You can have a much more tight knit community by having a one of one, like a one unit NFT that's non divisible, that has some PFP art to it that makes you feel unique. It's more like gang and hive mentality. So there's things psychologically, you're going to see communities building more around NFTs. Of course, there's still going to be layer ones and other things. But when you see it, just spend the time in the community. If there's an obsessive community and it's growing, you're in the right place. Right. If you if there's an obsessive no, it, community fun. and it's growing, but it's moon people just who can't speak like one sentence without making you know anything you know uh, intelligent to say, then that's a scam community. But like if it's a community that has ideas and propositions and uh, you know direction and you see the the collaboration there and it ma feels magical, like that's I think step one is find your community. Yeah, no, I man, I could not have again said said it better because I I think that communities are a hallmark of like successful cryptos, and if you find a strong community that you vibe with, um, stick around and explore it because there's probably going to be some of your greatest treasures uncovered from that. Um, man, Brian, this was a killer killer time. Sorry. Thank you for for actually going over. We spent 50 minutes together. I know we said I was probably going to keep it to 30 or 45, but you've been very gracious with your time today. Um, and just all your explanations. Um, we really appreciated it, and we would love to have you back on the Crypto 101 podcast. Aaron's probably going to be very sad he missed out on this when he listens to it. Probably has a million more questions for you. So uh, maybe we'll, we'll have you back on sure, sometime man. in 2023. Yeah. yeah, we can definitely do a follow up. You know, we're going to be delivering a lot more like software releases and growing the community. We got new branding and stuff coming up at the beginning of the year. So a lot of use cases coming coming to to real world production. So definitely should do a follow up uh, once those happen and kind of check in. So thanks to you and Crypto One Hundred and One for hosting.
and uh, talk soon and see you later to the community. All right. Love it. Everybody at home listening, stick around. Uh, We're going to bring back some more guests for you guys later on in the week. All right. Have a great day, guys. 